Welcome to this exciting panel that will be focusing on installations of the future initiatives. And I would like to briefly introduce our distinguished panel with our chair, Richard Kidd, being last. To my right, Lieutenant Colonel Retired Kevin Avon. Kevin Avon is the lead partner for an elite account in IBM's global services public sector, which provides secure enterprise resource planning, business analytics, and IT infrastructure operations in support of Army missions. He joined IBM in 2005 after serving 23 years in Army operational logistics worldwide. He is a graduate of Western Michigan University and holds a master's degree from Ball State University. Next, Mr. Justin Bean. Justin Bean is the director of Smart Spaces and Video Intelligency Marketing at Atachi Ventera, which brings Internet of Things solutions to market with the mission of social innovation. He is the recipient of the Think Prize for renowned innovation. He worked in the U.S. and overseas on projects including smart cities, smart parking, electric vehicles, and renewable energy. Mr. Bean holds an MBA in sustainable management. Next, Ms. Deborah Lamb. Deborah Lamb is the Managing Director of Smart Cities and Inclusive Innovation for Georgia Tech and has a mandate to drive smart communities and urban innovation across the university and beyond. She has been selected as one of the top 50 women in technology nationally. Ms. Lamb is a graduate of Georgetown University and the University of California, Berkeley. Next, Colonel Patrick Duggan. Colonel Duggan is the commander of Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall in Washington, D.C. He is a career special forces officer with combat and operational deployments across the Middle East and Asia. Colonel Duggan is a certified information system security professional. He is a prolific award-winning author on cyber special operations. He speaks Arabic, Tagalog, French, and Spanish. Colonel Duggan is a graduate of North Georgia Military College and the Naval Postgraduate School. And finally, Secretary Richard Kidd, our panel chair. Richard Kidd is the Deputy Assistant Secretary of the Army for Strategic Integration. He leads the strategy development, resource requirements, and overall business transformation process for Army installations. Secretary Kidd has previous senior executive service assignments in the Departments of State, Energy, and the Army, and in the White House. He is a graduate of the U.S. Military Academy and holds a master's degree from Yale University. Let's have a round of applause for our talented panel. I will now turn the microphone over to Secretary Kidd, panel chair, to introduce this important topic. Hey, Jeff, thanks so much for those kind words of introduction. And General Swan and AUSA, thanks for hosting this important right. event. We, we feel it is, uh, is important for the Army that we don't forget. And I know they're going to be talking about Futures Command this afternoon. But I did brief General Cardone a couple of times on this, and there's the one sentence takeaway, and we can all do this together. You don't get a modern army without modern installations. You're here. All right? So if you forget everything else, you can go with that two-second blurb. In order to have a modern army, you've got to have modern installations. So I'm going to uh, show some of the slides that I briefed actually to General Cardone uh, last week about installations of the future to sort of set the stage for this afternoon's panelists. Really appreciate everyone coming. We've worked hard to get some thought leaders from industry, academia, and the Army here to challenge some of your views and to start to think a little bit differently about installations. Next slide. So if we're going to think differently, let's start at the top. There's three major drivers affecting Army installations. Changes in uh, requirement dictated by our doctrine, changes in threat, and opportunities of new technology. So if you look at the top, this is how multi-domain battle, the schema schematic of multi-domain battle. In the middle there is air-land battle, which was the new doctrine when I came into the Army in 1982. That new doctrine, or that airland battle, the war started, the back end of the fight was someplace else. It was over the ocean someplace else. Under, under multi-domain battle in the strategic support area, it recognizes that installations are part of the fight. Like the Air Force General said this morning, that's where the forward edge of the battle is on the, on the perimeter of our installations. 
It's our installations are now where we deploy from. We control units in contact with the enemy. We fuse intelligence. We perform daily combat operations right now on installations here in the United States. The enemy recognizes that, and that goes to the box on the threats. All right, they will reach out and touch us here. Our installations are no longer sanctuaries. There will be cyber attacks, information warfare attacks. Our, our, our noble National Guard soldiers have already had their social media and accounts of themselves and their families attacked when they've deployed here on domestic uh, issues. We know this is coming, as well as unconventional warfare. But at the same time, there's this tremendous opportunity being driven by great firms in the private sector. A couple of them are on the panel, but there's others out there. Our, our communities all across America, our, our communities and cities, are trying, are, are, are rapidly moving towards the technologically enabled delivery of public goods and services, all right? Whether it's uh, smart garbage cans that we heard about earlier today, integrated infrastructure, traffic management, a whole variety of goods and services are being delivered to the citizens in these smart cities and towns. And oh, by the way, those are the same citizens that we're going to recruit into our army. So if they're used to growing up in that sort of connected, enabled, smart environment, they're going to expect it on our installations. So we have, an, uh, we have a recruitment and retention issue. Next slide. Actually, don't, not, oh, go back. All right, so, um, so the vision for the smart installation, if you see this here, this is, it could be any city, but there's also some symbols for things that are important to the Army, whether it's security, soldier wellness, uh, uh, synthetic training areas. And the vision over here, and you can read that for where we want to go on our, on our um, smart cities, but there's the word technology. Technology and partnerships are in the vision statement. And I just want to highlight that, that for everyone here in the room. Next slide. Okay, this, do I have another slide? This is supposed to be my, uh-oh. Uh-oh, all right, well, hey, that's fine. That's fine. So, um, so the key to smart installations is, is data, all right? We heard it earlier this morning. Uh, Better way to remember it, you know, data is the new bacon. Everything goes better with bacon. Everything goes better with data, all right? So you should think of a, a mass of sensors that are collecting data, bringing that together, and then allowing artificial and machine learning to artificial intelligence enhance decision making, all right? An example, of course, could be frictionless entry. If we have sensors out there, we can tell the weight of your vehicle, the electromagnetic spectrum uh, of your vehicle, whether your vehicle is emitting any radiation, and uh, if it has the same axle weight that it does every day, and it's the same person in the vehicle, just drive right on. Don't stop. Okay, we can do that now. So, but we can also learn things when we take the, sol the data at the soldier level, so when our soldiers, when you have that connected, integrated soldier, and we're keeping biometrics on their performance on the range, what they eat, you know, they take a picture, what they eat, their nutritional level, their PT scores, their eyesight, we develop this connected soldier, and then we, de then we deliver tailored training on our installation. So the connected soldier is part of a connected installation. And on that installation we, is where we build readiness and build culture. We're going to collect the information about soldiers and their units. Okay? And then we're going to be able to use that data across all the things that the Army does. So if a, if a piece of kit is always breaking, we should know that quickly through the calls to replace that part. All right? If you have a certain squad or company that is maxing out is rifle marksmanship scores, what are the NCOs doing differently at that, in that particular company? So this data from the soldier to the base goes to the enterprise. And if you look at our installations, you've heard earlier today about the backlog of, uh, of degraded facilities, the requirements to fund services, the requirements to fund our installations. Well, Maybe we're never going to get out of that paradigm. Maybe we're never going to get out of that funding deficit if we keep the same business model. All right? And data could allow us to develop a different business model to deliver plenty of goods and services. 
Um, you know, we're going to talk about whether or not commissaries or PXs, we could have that debate for years, probably be on the corner of some, you know, some street, you know, Patton Avenue, because every Army base has a street called Patton Avenue. We're going to be on the street, you know, Patton Amino Avenue in one of the 75 IMCOM bases. We're going to talk about whether or not the, the, the PX matters when the drones are going to just start flying by our heads and delivering the packages to the houses on the base. So business is changing dramatically, and we need to change our business model. So next slide. And so I just wanted to let you know that we are doing things right now today. Um, I got to laugh. You know, Ms. Hammock was in the room this morning, you know, so as, and Mr. Gillis was on the stage today. The more things change, the more they stay the same. So when Ms. Hammock was here, I'd say, ma'am, we can give you 100, 100 megawatts of projects a year from now. And so she'd come up on this very stage and she'd tell AUSA, we're going to deliver 200 megawatts of projects. And that was, that was how I would, you know, recraft my, uh, perform my, my input from my performance evaluation. So, so, so I told Mr. Gillis, I said, sir, we're building money into the palm. We're going to have a pilot project for you by 2020. So did you hear what he said this morning? He just shaved a year off of that. He said 2019, and you reinforced him, ma'am. So I got to go back. I got to go back and rewrite my performance evaluation. Thanks to AUSA. Appreciate that, General Smart. Anyway, no, we are doing stuff. A lot of it is we're recognizing the good work of innovative garrison commanders like Pat on the end. He's going to tell you some great things about Meyer, Fort Benning, elsewhere. There's great success stories in the Army. Uh, you know, we're going to shamelessly tie a ribbon around some of that and take credit for it. But the point is, there's, from lots of different vectors are coming to the right conclusion. And one of the real thought leaders in the Army is Major General Promotable Eric Wesley, who happens to be a classmate, who's going to command ARCIC, all right? So the thought leader for the Army, his, he's a senior mission commander at Fort Benning, and Fort Benning is one of the most advanced installations in the Army in terms of integrated building management control systems feeding into a command post. So General Wesley's coming at the same conclusion, but from a different angle, and I think that's great. So, um, <clears throat> hey, Catherine, nice of you to make it. I made a joke about you before you got here, so you weren't able to defend yourself. <laughs> uh, so anyway, we've got four, uh, five lines of effort that we're working on across the Army to help develop our smart installations um, from working with TRADOC on the doctrine and the doctrinal development to uh, studies with RAND, uh, AXIM-led study on RAND about Internet of Things, um, Army Science Board. We just had the Army Science Board out at uh, Redmond, Washington last week. I think some of you were there, Colonel Foley and others. Bud building money into the Palm. We're doing a, a serious gaming activity for our installation senior staff. Um, and we've got the Army Corps of Engineers ERDIC, uh, team. I know there's some ERDIC reps here in the room building a modeling program for us to take a look at what happens on our installations. So you heard I forget who the speaker was this morning about, well, take that building off, put this building in. How does it affect the model? We're working on that. And then, of course, a lot of outreach here, uh, a lot of public outreach like this event and others. I would like to draw everyone's attention to um, the Mad Scientist Forum. Okay, so um, one of our, our strongest partners is actually the Training and Doctrine Command. Remember, as I started when I talked about multi-domain battle, so Training and Doctrine Command has a process for thinking about the future. Part of that process is to bring in mad scientists, if you will, sort of a hackathon to look at different aspects about the future of the Army, whether it's biomachine convergence, warfare in urban environments. So we are hosting with TRADOC a mad scientist event on future installations. It'll be at Georgia Tech. No, there is a coincidence here, all right? And it's going to be uh, the third week in June. If you'd like to be invited, please give me your card. But look, I don't want the account manager or the business development or the Army rep from your organization. I really want the mad scientist, all right? I want someone who thinks differently, is forward-leaning, and is willing to go outside of the, you know, we're this corporation, we can solve all the Army's problems, just pay us enough, all right? So we really want some innovative, creative thinkers. So if you want to come, make sure you give me a card, or is John Thompson here? Shelly and John, they got their hands up. Give them a card, and we'll get you on the invite list. So I hope that set the stage. Looking forward to the discussion. And Jeff, back to you.
Okay, thank you very much. At this time, we're going to ask each of our four panel members, starting with Mr. Aben, to provide insights into installations of the future, particularly focusing on the impact of technology. Over to you, Kevin. Thank you. So next slide. And next slide. Um, so General Swan, General Bingham, Secretary Kidd, thank you so much for uh, uh, inviting me for this opportunity to participate in the panel today. Uh, many of you know me, I've been around this space for a while. And uh, so that I feel very fortunate. Uh, I've been part of IBM now for 12 or 13 years, um, was in the Army for 24 before that, and get an opportunity today to share with you some of the things that IBM is doing um, with smarter cities and in some cases um, some smarter installations. In fact, General Cooper brought up an example today where uh, we're using our augmented intelligence called Watson uh, with an Air Force smarter installation project, and we've done that for the past year with them. Um, so we've kind of broken this into four general areas, IoT, which I'm sure, Justin, you're going to cover even more thoroughly. But in IoT, as I look at that, uh, look at, for example, like a project we're doing in Dublin, Ohio. Uh, just north of Columbus, Ohio, you can imagine the kind of traffic congestion that happens around Ohio State's campus, uh, you know, pretty much every Saturday in the fall. So in Dublin, Ohio, what we've helped them do is tie together the data. They've had the data, but how do you tie it together? And how do you show it on a dashboard and make it available for decision makers to make decisions? And so we've done that in Dublin. Uh, and what, what that also allows you to do is so you have an emergency vehicle situation. You're trying to get an emergency vehicle from point A to point B. How do you give them the best route to do that uh, in a scenario where it's very difficult to know what the congestion looks like? In this situation, now they can um, at the LAX airport, similar sort of situation with congestion. Uh, we've brought in an augmented intelligence solution into their environment where they're using um, augmented intelligence to help them see their environment better so decision makers can make better decisions. Um, a similar um, solution when you think about IoT would be what we've done with the striker vehicles with LOGSA. So what we've done for about the past year now with, uh, with LOGSA is to take the sensor data off of strikers and be able to be more predictive of when the striker vehicles are going to fail. You can think through all the similar comparisons of how that would work in an installation and what kind of information that would help you um, predict when you need to have this size of a maintenance team or that size of a maintenance team. If you could have ordered those parts six months before, could have you gotten them for less because you could have, uh, you could have used that, um, um, that knowledge to help you create a better buying model when you're dealing with uh, the companies that you have to buy the kind of repair parts you do for HVAC systems or for uh, the, the facilities you have to uh, take care of. Uh, we have continuous, we have auto, uh, autonomous vehicles down in Miami-Dade, for example. The, the shuttle service that they're using in Miami-Dade is now being done with unmanned vehicles. You know, there's, for all the years we've been on around military installations, we can see where those kind of scenarios would help us buy back labor that we would prefer to use in other, other areas versus using them to operate shuttle services on our bases. And then, of course, drones. And, and we showed this at the most recent AUSA where we use drones today in a lot of commercial venues. Um, so you're trying to go out and look at a, an oil rig. Uh, do you really want to send an entire team out to determine whether the oil rig's having infrastructure issues, or would you like to send out a $20 or $30 drone that can sit out there and take video surveillance for hours? Better still, you can teach the augmented intelligence how to interpret that video and then give you warnings that the, that the, autonom or, uh, the augmented intelligence can help you then predict when something is going to fail. That's commercial technology being used today all around the world with, aut with drone technology and then that video being consumed uh, by an augmented intelligence to be able to help predict future problems. Um, biometrics on here, it was already mentioned earlier, the uh, frictionless entrance and exit and what that would mean. Uh, and, you know, uh, in the commercial world where, you know, at least in, in IBM where we're doing it, uh, uh, if you go to any of the uh, major Canadian airports, all eight of them, um, there are self-service kiosks there where you can, where it's, it's got both facial recognition and biometric recognition of who you are and makes your entrance and exit much quicker. Uh, similarly, with the United States Customs and Border Protection, there's now 23 locations across the United States where you have this frictionless entrance and exit 
through biometrics, kind of what you mentioned before, if you generally are who you were before the other hundred times you went through that door, then you're gonna be allowed to go back and forth through that door, unless of course the security conditions change. Next slide, I gotta get through my next two. Cognitive computing, um, I talked Stryker. Um, recently we just uh, were part of a, um, an assessment done by Penn State where 21 companies for the Army G4 um, were given a raw set of sensor data and can you predict when a vehicle is going to fail. Uh, we were one of three companies that participated successfully in that and helped the Army understand that sensor data is not all sensor data. And that sensor data comes in a lot of different forms and so it's not just simply consuming that data but making sure that you've got a system that can learn and understand that data as, you're, as it's coming in. And then finally, we see cloud and cybersecurity as being the underpinning for any of these technologies. Uh, you know, the ability to, to take advantage of the cloud ROI for cost combined with cybersecurity to protect it. Um, you know, we've built the Army's first private cloud down at Huntsville. You know, it's operational today, and it gives the Army alternatives to how they want to take advantage of the challenges of consolidating their data centers and reducing the amount of cost that's going into data centers today. Thank you. I ran a minute long. Okay, Mr. Justin Bean. <laughs> sure, thank you, Kevin. That was great. Sorry. Good intro. No, awesome. <laughs> uh, so next slide. There we go. Uh, so I wanted to start with this to just talk about some of the bigger trends that are going on. Um, so what we're seeing here is the digit digitization of the world around us, right? A lot of these new troops and recruits that are coming in are coming from this world that's already been digitized. They don't know what a Rolodex is outside of maybe an app, right? They probably never use a printer, right? Everything is on the phone, everything's digitized. And so they're expecting that the tools that they can use are all digital and that they're all modern. And when they come from this world, of ubiquitous technology, everything's very convenient and data-driven, um, and also free. As you saw there in the end, all of these things that used to cost money to go out and buy as a product are now a free app that's sitting on their phone, which gives them the same value, if not more conveniently, because they can get it at a moment's notice. They don't leave anything at home. It's all connected to the cloud. They expect that. The other thing that they expect is that the places they go are intelligent. So when we talk about smart spaces, we're talking about retail environments, we're talking about airports, we're talking about college campuses and cities and transportation and transit. They expect that when they walk into a retail establishment, or let's start with the, well, let's, let's start with the websites. When they go to a retail website, they expect that that website is tracking where they go on that website, which pages and links they click on, how long they spend there, and then for that to be intelligent and then feed them ads that bring them the things that they're looking for. So they're expecting the world to do this for them because of all the intelligence that's already out there, which is great, right? And so they're gonna come into these bases expect it, expecting it to be a smart space as well and to be gathering all this intelligence and feeding them back feedback to help them be smarter, healthier, more effective, whatever it is that they can do to be a better soldier. Uh, so that's the, the positive side. And as we see all these things becoming free, we get to a sort of zero marginal cost society where you have free energy coming in from the sun, renewables feeding these digital products that are cheap or free, much more abundance, much more availability for a lot of people, which is great. We're having a lot of new products and services that are much easier to provide to broader numbers of people. On the other side of that, all of these products used to be made by a person and probably factories. Uh, so when we look at the manufacturing and production of some of these things, and then we add in things like autonomous vehicles that we're seeing come on the road more and more with things like autonomous trucks, those are going to take away a lot of jobs that don't require college education. Because of that, we're gonna see increasing levels of economic inequality, which often leads to more interpersonal violence, possibly extremism, and the threats, make those threats more likely to occur in the homeland. Uh, so that's the downside of this. So we need to prepare for that and we need to make sure that we're doing everything we can to keep everyone safe in that environment. If we make it through that transition, that's a beautiful world we get to, right? Massively abundant, it's great. Um, so that's what they're gonna expect. Next slide, please. Uh, and so one source of data that I'll call out that's ubiquitous nearly everywhere uh, and isn't being very productive as it is, is video. 
So thanks to computer vision and machine learning and artificial intelligence, a lot of this data that's already throughout our cities being gathered in buildings, being gathered in airports, on trains, vehicles, what have you, has the capacity through intelligence to become insights and become automated alerts. So instead of it just being this image or these images that are coming into a command center where somebody's supposedly looking at, but probably looking at their phone most of the time, uh, and then going back and investigating if something happens, they can get an automated alert that tells them what is the important data? What do I need to look at immediately? What's the facial recognition that popped up that's an anomaly that I need to look at? Where is there an intrusion? Where is there a left behind object that needs to be addressed? So there's a big security side, but there's also an operational side that can come from that same data. So we're seeing video as one of the most underutilized sources of data that's out there today and one that's already ubiquitous and can be turned into all of these insights and alerts. So that's a big part of how we see smart cities and smart spaces. Um, so when you look at an airport, right, I think it offers a good analogy to, to a base because security and safety, number one across the board. Airports need to keep people safe wherever they are in the airport. But they also need to make sure that they have good customer service. It doesn't take a long time to get from the ticket counter to the gate. So if you have queue detection and these other things going on, you know when you need to send out another ticket agent, open another security gate, another passport control officer. And then once they get to the, to the terminal, they're basically in a shopping mall. There's all these businesses, there's all these retailers that can use this data to make smarter business decisions to serve their, uh, serve their customers better. So that's a big part of this. Um, and when we talk about these smart spaces, it applies not only to this world where these troops are coming from, but to the places where they're going and the installations and the bases they're going to. So I would say that data is probably the new sausage. But <laughs> you probably <laughs> So it comes in in all these different ways, but it's not really food until you get it in the package, right? Um, but maybe a better analogy is, is that it's the new gasoline. You can get crude oil and it's very valuable. You can sell it, but it doesn't have much use until you refine it and turn it into something that can drive a vehicle or fly a jet or be used in different ways to become plastics and pharmaceuticals and those things. Uh, so this data is incredibly valuable. You need ways of processing it, the analytics that help to tell you what's happening in the real world and what to do about it. Uh, so I'll stop there and pass it to Deborah. Okay, Deborah Lamb. Next slide. Hello, everyone. So I just have one slide for us, and I don't have any fancy graphics or videos to show off, but um, I do have uh, complimentary thoughts um, to uh, the other panelists, especially Mr. Kidd, in terms of setting up the scene. So first of all, how we define smart is very process-oriented. So it's important to know that there's no end state. You don't hit smart and then wipe your hands and then be done with it. And because of it being an end state or not an end state, because of the evolving culture, the change in technology, the change in views of how we live, it's really important to think of smart as multidimensional. Um, and this is where I have my first triangle here that looks at it beyond just one singular or set of technologies. Technology is certainly very important, but if you start with the technology, you're not going to hit smart. And in fact, what I've seen um, is you end up getting into what I call a technology arms race, right? Where you have one city or one entity saying, I've purchased 15,000 LED streetlights. Therefore, I am smart. Notice that correlation there. And then you have another city or another entity that says, I've purchased 50,000 LED streetlights. I am smarter than the first city. And you can see how it keeps going from that, right? So similar to what it says before, like it's important to have the components, one dimension, as in the technology, the software, the hardware, the data, the tools. But if you don't know how to use it, if you don't know what the function is, the second slide, um, or you can't apply it. And then when I say application, I mean very much at the education and training level of soldier readiness, right? If you can't apply it, if you don't have the systems to really um, appreciate it, then it's very limited. 
And then finally, you hit the final slide side of the triangle is where is this all going? What is the vision? What's the point of being smart? Why are we all going to be smart? You know, I mean, we're gathered here today, but that fundamental question is really important. And that fundamental question lies in the culture and the local context. So at the end of the day, every unit, every installation, whether it's the Army or the Navy or um, civilian cities, they each have a purpose to be in SMART. Resilience, sustainability, cost effectiveness, and we all need to understand what that goal is and understand what those tools are necessary in order to hit that goal and what kind of applications are required for us to do that. And so that triangle in terms of how we see um, SMART is very important to think about those sides. The second triangle I want to showcase is understanding the scales of SMART. So for a long time, smart cities, you know, and I'm using the small Cs for smart cities, was very much focused on large and mega cities. They dominated that, um, uh, I would say, ecosystem. And it resulted in a very exclusive elite domain, meaning that a lot of other um, communities, a lot of other um, demographics or scales didn't think that it applied to them or were ignorant about that. Now, when I defined SMART, I said it was very process-oriented. So it's the application of the tools and technologies and data to improve the quality of life. Nothing in that process denotes you have to be a certain population scale, you have to be a certain GDP level, you have to hurt a certain demographic or geography. There's no limitations to that. But because the early, um, I would say, visionaries of SMART was so exclusive, it actually caused higher inequalities um, when it came to driving SMART, when in fact, we were trying to lower the barriers of inequality. And so I really want to emphasize the scales, and this is what Mr. Kidd did really well, in terms of emphasizing you can also be SMART from an installation perspective. And it can connect everything from an individual perspective, from a soldier readiness, to a mega region of uh, larger several installations. And just to know that those scales are really important to drive in SMART, even from our university as Georgia Tech, when we say SMART, we need to learn to walk the talk as well. So what does it mean to be a SMART campus? And how does a SMART campus essentially feed into the larger context of a city and region? And how does it then go up into even a student on campus being SMART? You know, those scales are important to think about that process. And so finally, it's, it's important to think about that partnership um, that we, you know, we as a university are playing in with the industry, with the Army, with the government at all scales. So I'll end there and really look forward to the discussion. Okay, Colonel Duggan. Hi, how's everyone doing? So no slide for me, uh, but before I get into my pitch here, I want to be sure to thank AUSA for the opportunity to be well up here, as well as recognize a lot of the distinguished leaders and esteemed panel members. So my name is Colonel Pat Duggan, says so right here, and I'm the commander of Joint Base Meyer Henderson All. And fair warning, two things, I am the designated doom and gloom guy, and number two, every single thing I say does not re reflect the views of the Army or AUSA, all right? So don't be quoting me out there. All right, so AUSA recently published an article entitled, entitled Modernization for Industrial Age, U.S. Army Installations. Who's got it? Somebody wave it. I know you got it. Somebody picked it up. So I'm up here to unpack the key assertion, which is tomorrow's character of conflict will be increasingly asymmetric, and it will take place on American soil, specifically our future Army installations. My purpose up here is to briefly highlight just three emerging ways it could happen, but more importantly, hopefully offer solutions to counter those same exact threats from breeding in our own backyard. Number one. Drones, right, the sexy topic du jour. Already mounted with guns, chemicals, and explosives, drones can operate as singletons and teams or swarms and come in a wide range of sizes, shapes, styles, and speeds. 
There's drones that can carry people, act as motherships, mimic insects, dive bomb kamikaze style, and transformer drones that switch up between land, sea, and air all in one. And guess what? Every year, they get faster, easier to use, and more affordable. Last year, a drone destroyed the largest ammo depot in the world in eastern Ukraine, causing over a billion dollars of damage with only one thermite grenade. Last fall, Israel scrambled two fighter jets and launched a Patriot missile to destroy a Hezbollah drone, literally spending $5 million to take out something that maybe cost 5000 this year, DIY drones swarm attacked a Russian airbase in Syria, carrying homemade explosives. I'm going to go over the three minutes. Look at racing drones, which have leapt in speed from 115 miles per hour in 2015 to 179.6 miles per hour in 2017, in just two years. Meaning the kinetic impact of a one-pound object going that fast equals 1,400 joules of energy, or equivalent to an AK-47 slug at 50 yards. All right, so here's the pivot, right? While there's certainly a lot of rhetoric, anecdotes, and drama over appropriate levels of concern we could and should have, here's the crux of the problem. Where the heck is our data? The fundamental problem for installations is that there is no pool of data to help inform higher discussions about the proper regulatory or legal considerations with drones because we have no pool of data which helps characterize and categorize whether what we see or don't see near our own bases is or is not a threat. To me, this is a no-brainer and is the easiest part of the problem to solve. Why discuss shooting drones down without first determining the threat? Is it or is it not existential? Then we can best discuss how. In my assessment, we must first acquire the correct technology to help detect patterns and identify intentions and do it now. The added benefit to solving the X part of the problem first is that as the miniaturization of asymmetric threats accelerates, we at least have a baseline to start. Number two. Social media weaponization. Today in our nation, we have a dynamic dubbed fake news. Unfortunately, it is real, it will increase, and it is driven by two critical phenomena. The first is the media industry's hapless race to the bottom to pursue ever more salacious headlines, incentivized by increasingly elusive revenue and profits. And the second is the inexorable march of AI-generated content and computer-enhanced effects, which will increasingly turbocharge the fake news. Unlike the good old days when the media establishment once relied on stable subscriptions and viewer loyalty, digital networks have decisively changed the landscape and given everyone anywhere the ability to report anything they want. While great for hobbyists and opportunists, this pressures traditional establishments to pursue edgier content and compress time for verification in order to secure an ever-fracturing market share splintered by ever more fickle social media likes. This food fight over an attention deficit viewer ecosystem is fed by a motley crew of self-declared journalists, unscrupulous actors, and unsubstantiated content whose resulting effects have polarized and sensationalized perspectives. Here's the problem. This dynamic is absolutely an exploitable flaw in our society, and adversaries can masterfully exploit it to target specific sectors, especially insular ones, just like some, I don't know, maybe some of our own installation communities. Think about the nature of our military communities. Are they not isolated from our society, perhaps in values, culture, and traditions? What about physically? Are they really resilient enough to interpret truth from fiction when they're digitally bombarded? Social media is not about technology, but about sociology, and as the speed of digital networks amplify fake media coverage, our military communities are increasingly vulnerable because they are ready-made, compartmented social networks susceptible to echo chamber effects. Adversaries will increasingly target communities on our installation with geotag pics, videos, and fake content. Russian operatives have already targeted soldiers and their family with misleading content using mil-specific tags like hashtag GoArmy and will continue to use social media to mislead, distort, and dismay readers and dock, spoof, and flood spaces with compromised personal data and or info already in circulation. Why, you ask? Why? Well, it's kind of simple. The U.S. military continues to be the number one most respected institution in America and thus the public tends to place a whole lot of trust in its military leaders, communities, and issues. Thus, your opinions matter. All right, so let me hit topic two, AI-generated fake content. 
Right now, it's more slapstick than serious, but the implications of highly realistic AI-generated videos, interviews, and statements emulating military leaders, soldiers, and families pose serious danger to our current design. Right now, hacktivist trolls and sock puppets can already use powerful graphics software to fabricate audio and video, but much more sophisticated AI manipulation tools are coming. Soon, AI social engineering attacks will exploit online military info to generate customized websites, emails, and links sent from addresses that mimic a soldier's real contents and their specific writing style, and even perhaps visually masquerade as a friend in a video chat. So while today the face-swapping fad seems benign, let me remind you that it's only in its infancy now an increasingly sophisticated and affordable AI will cause the lines between what's real and fake to only blur more. So what can Army installations do? First, we must explore counter social media platforms, ones that employ some of the same AI processes that draw on cross disciplines to search for hidden patterns, relationship correlation, and interdependencies in the data. Second, we must better educate our communities on the dangers of social media weaponization, not the personal hygiene fluff and stuff currently being done, albeit still needed, but the harder edge digital force protection stuff like you will receive false messages, you are a meme warfare target, you will be digitally compromised, and you will be fooled by military junk news. And in turn, this is what you do. Last minute, third one, I'm going to close out with cyber attacks. Today, there is no such thing as a non-IoT installation. Instead, they are a growing zoo of targetable devices and footholds for cyber attack. In only two years, there's going to be over 50 billion connected devices, wearables, ingestibles, and sensors on, around, under, and over all our installations, being perpetually fueled by declining costs, more powerful processing capabilities, and ever-growing availability. Everything that can be connected will be, creating unforeseen implications to our sprawling community's intractable fixation to the latest device. And with over 15,000 computer networks spread amongst 4,000 worldwide institutions, installations, some of which are based on similar, if not flawed, underlying technology, software, and hardware, you'll find this is a growing problem for which we're ill-prepared. But don't take my word for it. Take GAOs. According to a report last year, there's, quote, no single lead office or organization in DOD responsible for IoT security, end quote. And the lack of guidance, organization, policies, or even a standardized definition of IoT Hobbles collective efforts. So what? Who cares? Get to your point, right? Tell me something I don't know. Here's the million-dollar question, audience. If we know IoT is such a potential asymmetric problem, then I ask you, where is our IoT test bed for installations? Where is our controlled experimental environment to implement custom user scenarios, examine results, test interconnections, and evaluate technologies in a safe and secure manner? Do we connect all things, some things, which things? Stationary, mobile, or cloud or sensors? Where do you start? As adversaries conduct bolder attacks against our infrastructure, isn't it time we pursued an IoT testbed to develop the active security measures future installations will need? So in conclusion, tomorrow's character of conflict will be increasingly asymmetric, and it most certainly will happen in our own backyard. Whether drones, social media warfare, or cyber attacks, they are but the tip of the iceberg of which more is coming. So here's your takeaway. If we don't change the way we think about U.S. Army installations, our outdated industrial age model ain't going to get us very far. Wow, what a great panel. All right. Yeah. Okay, Richard, you got a question to tee up? Well, I, I had a couple of questions, but I've been overwhelmed by the quality of the presenters. So first of all, I'd like to thank all of you. You did a great job. Thank you very much. Um, we had four canned questions. I'm going to sort of dispense, and we prepared them in advance. So I'm going to dispense with those canned questions because you guys are so smart, you don't need them. Um, <clears throat> I'd like to have one sort of big question, and you can approach it as you see fit. Change. Each of you has talked about elements of data, of sensors, of management that are going to change. I'd like you to highlight how fast or the rate of change, what your predictions are for the future. So does the Army need a future installations 2020 strategy, 2040 strategy, 2050 strategy? How do we need to prepare for change over time? And then what do you think will be most disrupted by this change, either positive or negative? And then finally, is in your assessment, 
what characteristics do organizations need to have to adapt their cultures to this change? And if you want to, you know, at the risk of being thrown out, you could do an assessment of the Army's culture. So long question, change, your predictions as to the rate of change, what will be disrupted, and what are the characteristics of organizational culture that need to be pot in order to make that change more positive? All right. So who wants to in, who wants to start with that? How about how about Deborah? Since you're from academia, you're a professor. You're you're ready. And aren't you? Don't you want to go to Georgia Tech now for the Mad Scientist event? Yeah. There you go. Let me, let me hark back on the word resilience was used a lot throughout the morning session, and I think it has a lot to do with change. So I'm using Rockefeller's definition for resilience, but what that means is um, predictable and unpredictable shocks and stresses and our ability to bounce forward from it. And this means that there are immediate shocks that happen into a system you know, such as an earthquake, such as a, a natural disaster. And then there's long-term stresses, agent infrastructure, changes in the culture. Um, and some of this is predictable, you know, in terms of our careful planning um, to address this. Some of this is entirely unpredictable. You know, it's very hard to predict each and every single thing that happens to us all the time. And so how we are to be resilient or affect this change in the system is that we need to be able to accommodate for this type of unpredictability that could happen and understand the different shocks and stresses that happen into the system. Um, and this is where I think SMART comes in. So for the first time ever, we are going through a process where we say we want to be resilient or we want to be sustainable or we want to be cost effective right, um, or we want to be energy efficient. And these are very strong visions, but we never really had the means to do that. Meaning, we never really had data to help us understand what those baselines were or understand what the targets meant. And we never really had the tools and technology to kind of extract and pull that data to hit that vision, to hit resilience, to hit sustainability. So this is why it's a very exciting time when you talk about Mr. Kidd's um, question around change, because the rate of change and the extent of change is very hard to predict, and it's going to go faster. But what we do have for the first time is the resilient system that allows us to become smarter in that process. Yeah, in terms of rate of change, it's accelerating. There's no question about that. How fast is that curve and how fast will it compound? We don't exactly know, but there's all kinds of different predictions out there. I'm not going to throw one out as a headline or something. But for example, with artificial intelligence, it's supposed to cross the line of human intelligence in 2045, let's say, by Ray Carswell predicts that. What happens then? I think that's a huge wild card. Um, that could be the greatest thing that humanity's ever created, or it could be the end of humanity. Uh, and the beginning of a new type of electronic civilization. Let's go with Star, Star Trek on that one. Um, but the point being that I'd like to make is that there are two types of games. There are finite games and there are infinite games. And so with finite games, the goal of the game is to finish it and to win it, such as a conflict. You want that conflict to end and you want to win. With infinite games, you want it to continue, such as civilization. So there are conflicts that are finite games within the infinite game of civilization that you want to continue. So I would argue that it's, there are finite games like having a 2020 strategy and having a 2030 strategy and 2040 strategy that you can cap track your KPIs and your performance against. But there's also the infinite strategy of having an innovation strategy. And I think that's more important is not only being resilient, but being innovative and being able to uh, change at the rate of the change around you, which is incredibly difficult, right? Technology is now evolving faster than human beings and cultures have the capacity to change at. Will we be able to catch up with things like neural lace that will incorporate artificial intelligence into our brains? And then what the security risks are to that? It's a, it's a big wild card question. Um, but the, the bottom line of what I would say is that it should be about having an innovation strategy 
and an accelerating change strategy that helps the military and many other organizations understand how they're going to change and how they're going to advance uh, as the underlying foundation or framework within which the finite games of what is our 2020 strategy, 2030 strategy are. And so I'll try to, to take on the, uh, the, the question towards the end of this, which is, you know, the characteristics and, and what would make this more or, or less disruptive, I guess. One of the things that I think I've seen, especially now in the 13 years since I've not worn a uniform, is how you make this common assertion or assumption that because we're all in the military, you know, we're all dependents or we're soldiers, that we don't have to do change management. And, and I've seen more often than not when, when I look at these significant efforts to take on a new vision, to focus on, in this case, what technology might bring to installations of the future, there's an assumption that everybody is part of a team and I can just say, go stand there, and they will. Well, there's a portion of your community that will, in fact, do that. Um, but there's an awful big part from an installation management standpoint, I think you understand this better than most, that's not the case. You have vendors coming onto your post every day, you have business people trying to sell things on your post, you have dependents, you have soldiers, that vast community all has to be included in your thoughts on how you're going to instill an idea, a thought process of change management. And I think that's an important aspect that's often missed in, in these large visions of installation of 2020 or 2030 or 2040, it really won't matter unless you take on the additional level of effort that it's going to take to make that vision something that is believable, acceptable, and that you have community members that are all driving towards that installation of the future. And so your ability to exercise change management, I think, will have an awful lot to do. Because as we all know, the people in this room, you're in charge for this moment. Your moment lasts a year, lasts three years, lasts four years. But we all know our business is that you're not going to be the person who's going to see the installation of the future. So who's going to see the installation of the future is who you should be orienting your change management towards. And how are you going to communicate that and connect those dots for the next decade or two decades? What, you know, it might be something as simple as uh, putting the bite in fight. Silly little catchphrase, you know. No one, you know, thought about it when and bite being spelled B-Y-T-E for the organization that came up with that little catchphrase. But that idea, that responsibility for you as leaders to market your vision, you don't get just to have a vision, you've got to market it. And you've got to market it one that will last for a decade or last for two decades to go through all these innovation and technology changes that are going to come at your constituency that lives on your installation or comes there every single day, whether they live there or not. And so I think that's an important aspect that you need to really consider as you're thinking your way through your installation of the future vision. Colonel Duggan, any comments? I always get a comment. So real quick, you know, I think the Army wrestles oftentimes with, hey, how much is this going to cost? So what are we doing? Hey, thinking is free, man. I mean, if we can find the right people and go back to this, you know, we want modernization, innovation, and disruption. That's the outputs of the system we want. Hey, check it out. It starts with human capital. Are we have, do we have the right system in place? It's not about managing talent. It's about optimizing that talent that you're going to need for future problems. There's a buzzword that's floating around called strategic latency. What that refers to, refers to is this uh, every piece of emerging technology has an inherent transformational potential, right? That there's a good side and a bad side. Who are the weirdos that think about this and write policy and strategy for the Army? We need to do a better job when it comes to grooming our young NCOs and officers. That's my opinion. Nobody else. Okay, thank you. I got a question for the whole panel here. Provide some examples where technology can reduce manpower requirements to run bases and thereby allow those human resources to be redirected to deployable Army and strength. Provide some examples where technology 
can reduce manpower requirements to run the installations and thereby allow those human resources to be redirected to deployable Army and strength. I'll start. Uh, duty drivers. How many companies pull a private or a specialist out and make them a duty driver? They can be an autonomous vehicle. Um, a lot of the uh, food service can be, uh, not the actual service, but the preparation delivery can be changed. Uh, frictionless entry, we can take a lot of the guards off the gates uh, and still have a very secure uh, perimeter. So, so those are a, a building. Uh, it, and it's also, I mean, the question is that we're going to lose people. I think the, the question is how do we improve the delivery of public goods and services with the same amount of people. So we've talked about building condition and the traditional way of, of, of assessing our buildings is to send out a team of engineers. Uh, so, so that's a lot of people and we're behind. And by the time we get the data in the system, it's late and it's not correct. So if we were to use both sensors and drones or you know, someone walking through with a camera that has intelligent photo uh, imagery analysis, you could maybe not reduce the number of people but, but actually get real live current data for building maintenance, repairs, predictive, uh, predictive maintenance, and other type of things. So uh, it's not so much a labor saving as it is labor enhancing. So in some cases it'll be labor saving, but in others it would be labor enhancing. Yeah, so we've responded to several RFPs and various services in the last couple of years, and the general conversation you know, conversation is how can augmented intelligence or machine learning change the dynamic of what our analysts do today? Pick whichever, whatever type of analyst you have out in the industry today. Generally today, they're spending about 80% of their time capturing data. They're capturing it, then they're transposing that into a spreadsheet that they're embedding in a PowerPoint and then delivering to, you know, a staff meeting at the end of that particular day. We're actually paying those analysts. You're paying those analysts to be analysts, and instead they're actually spending 80% of their time just trying to get their hands wrapped around the data. The idea is to switch that, just simply flip-flop that. I want to have analysts spending 80% of their time analyzing the data to help decision makers make better decisions. And that's the kinds of areas I think you're going to look for as you're trying to move towards installation of the future is what kind of tools can help you get that data captured in a simplified way, not the old model of let's build a structured database. Okay, we can, we've all done that. We've all lived in this room and gone through those experiences. We can spend the next four or five years defining that structured database, and at the end of it, you'll be mad at yourself because there'll be all sorts of data elements that you don't have access to that you threw on the floor because you couldn't figure out how to use them to answer the question of that particular commander for the day. And so I think you're looking for those areas where it's very clear that if you had all the data and you could have an analyst look at that data now coalesced by a machine, they could actually do what you want them to do, which is help you as decision makers make better decisions. And that to me is where you would look for those kind of areas when you're looking at how to potentially not necessarily reduce staff, but to make that staff better perform. Um, I, I think Deborah made a really good point earlier on, which is you need to start with what the outcome is that you're looking for, right? So is the uh, desired outcome of reducing staff to reduce costs? There are many ways of doing that, maybe building optimization, the utilization of the spaces on campus so you're not building out new buildings or you know, new infrastructure that you don't need, why not optimize the existing infrastructure? Maybe it's uh, optimizing programs. Uh, you know, there's plenty of great examples in smart cities and smart states. Uh, you know, one that we've worked with is Andhra Pradesh is a state in India where they're doing everything from uh, optimizing their agricultural outputs across different areas of the state so that the farmers have more productive crop yields and that don't end up in gluts where they get you know, low cost for their crops to uh, managing pharmaceutical distributions for social programs. So those pharmaceuticals don't fall off the truck somewhere and they don't have to pay someone to go and watch every single truck to make sure that it's getting delivered to the person needs heart medication and not to someone who's gonna sell that on the black market. So there's many ways of doing it, but starting with what is the outcome? What is the goal that you want to achieve? And then backing into the solution that provides that and then backing into the technology that creates the solution that brings you the outcome is the most important thing is starting with this design thinking approach. 
So that's it. Um, usually this question is, is a question around best practices or case studies or examples. And, and I actually have one, but it's actually one that did not work. Um, and I, I don't think we often have those because people aren't willing to share what didn't work and, and the failures. And this actually started when I was CIO for the city of Pittsburgh. And it actually is connected to smart trash cans that um, was spoke about earlier today. So we had a similar problem where we started where we had sanitation workers and we didn't have enough sanitation workers and, and trash was mounting in every week on the streets. And you know, we thought the, the way to solve this problem was to install smart trash cans. So every trash can in the city would have an RFID tag or sensor. So then you would only um, take the trash when it was full and then you didn't need to trade take the trash every single day on this particular route and that would free the sanitation workers to do other um, duties in the public works department so there was a way to address costs it was a way to address workforce development it was a way to address um, additional priorities that the city had um, and we thought this was just a brilliant idea um, you know really starting with the smart trash can with the RFID tag and we could also then start tracking the types of trash that would come out and, and the levels of trash so there would be tons of data that would come out of that too and it will allow us to assess the needs of the city um, we started with a pilot so you know a pilot in a separate in a segregated neighborhood you know um, that was willing to you know experiment with this pilot um, and everything from the technology um, and the data worked perfectly seemingly well what we did not account for was the culture and this is where mr. Kidd and others um, really spoke of you know at the individual level the sanitation worker takes great pride in their work each and every day they are supposed to um, dump 50 trash cans and if they don't do that they think they're not doing their work so if we say no you should only do 20 and then please do something else that wasn't as um, reflective of their proud and achievement in terms of their work. And so this is where we did not account for how does the technology account for the culture of the sanitation worker and how do we ensure that we can still hit the workforce development targets, we can still hit the data targets, and we can still address a lot of those smart technology while addressing the needs of the sanitation worker and understanding what it means to be a sanitation worker and the value of their work going forward. And so I think this is reflection on in terms of smart installations in terms of a mini city. At the end of the day, there's day-to-day -day operations and what makes an installation run, what makes a city run, and how do we incorporate those needs from the, the residents that are living there to the people that are supporting the services day in and day out. Okay, we got a question for Colonel Duggan. If given the necessary resources, what are the top one or two areas you would invest in for an installation of the future for Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall? So I'm going to scale that at a, since I can be king for a day, not Joint Base Meyer Henderson Hall. It's this convergence, right? It's the nexus of operational technology, informational technologies, the cyber physical systems. That's where we need to get on the ball in terms of the policy and authorities to come up with some comprehensive defensive plan because that's where you're going to get hit. Okay. Next question is for Richard Kidd. While this panel is to discuss futures, does your overall effort also have an outlet for short-term present capabilities you discover along the way? So, so the answer is, is yes. Um, you know, the Army, so there's, there's good news and bad news about the Army, I mean, in terms of our installations. The bad news is we've been in a constrained uh, cost environment for some time, and we have very significant uh, a range of bills, but the Army has been good at carving out both uh, uh, intellectual space and some amount of money to continually advance technologies and new ways of doing business. You know, we've, we've, uh, you've heard earlier speakers, you're going to hear Jack and his panel this afternoon. The Army has had a very strong sort of forward-leaning posture on energy resilience. And there's a number of success stories. General Bingham mentioned the one in Hawaii. So there are there is room for new uh, initiatives and ideas for bending 
rather than looking at the data from individual buildings is aggregating them on a post level in a sort of a command post environment. We have deployed autonomous vehicles at West Point and Fort Bragg to, to move wounded warriors and cadets around. So there are uh, efforts going forward as we do the major muscle movements around the Palm and around senior leader initiatives, you know, you heard Secretary Gillis talk this morning that installations of the future is one of his priorities towards mobilization or towards modernization. So when he says that, that is reflected in the planning guidance, which is reflected in the Palm, which leads to changes over time. So you are going to see this gradual and incremental advance towards resilience, towards uh, connected smart installations, towards that vision statement and that vision statement that was up there that wasn't just you know a group of people making that up. We moved it through the governance body, which was uh, the IR bod, which was talked about earlier this morning, and it was vetted by three star generals the, and, and all across the Army, and they approved it. So that is a, an approved Army vision for where we want to go on installations of the future. So there will be these outlets all along, but I think the most important point, I forget who said it, is it's this culture, right? We're never done. This is not a game that's over, okay? This is a game that we pass on to our, uh, you know, to the young lieutenants and sergeants who pass on to, to our children and grandchildren. So we've got to be uh, an army that is committed to both service and innovation, and we're in this game perpetually. And so are our enemies. Okay, this next question is for the whole panel. As we get closer to the concept and practice of a smart base, what are some of the privacy issues that need to be considered? Uh, all right, so, so, so I'll start, and it's not an answer, it's just an opportunity, and, and, and we need to, we've got a lot of communities involved here. We don't have the lawyers. But uh, uh, we should. So, so, so how would you answer this question? I had a very large company come to me a few weeks ago, and they said, we will instrumentize your entire base for free. We will build a 5G network to securely move the data, and we will build a command center to help you use it and analyze it. All our money, all free except what do they want in return? Well, this goes back to, is it sausage or is it bacon? <laughs> they want the data, okay? They want the data because as Deborah mentioned, a lot of the smart cities work has been done at the mega city level, you know, 10 million inhabitants. But what this company wanted to do was use the data on a small town, in this case, an army installation of 20, 30,000 people. And from that data, they would then develop a product that they could replicably sell to thousands of small towns all across America. So do we say yes or no to this offer? I don't know. But it's a very, I just share that as this is a very important question about what do we do, you know, what about privacy and what about data uh, and, uh, you know, where are we getting information about a soldier so that we can learn more about their contributions to the Army and where are we prying into their personal lives. So we did put, uh, we gave, it wasn't a very good study, but we did give a, a personal tracking device to a battalion of infantry soldiers. And we're trying to figure out what the correlations were. And we, we really didn't come up with much except for an interesting thing. The soldiers that got the least amount of sleep had the highest discipline, appeared to have more time under company grade actions and or domestic intervention by their chain of command. So did they have problems at home because they weren't sleeping or were they not sleeping because they had problems at home? And at what point does that become a command issue because the soldiers might not be ready? And what issue is it, you know, wh where, do we, where do we stop in terms of, of paying attention to what goes on inside the, the uh, houses of our soldiers? So these are very important issues. Those are just two examples, and I share them with you because I would love to hear back from members of the audience of where we, the Army, should posture. But this is the policy dynamic that we work out with the Secretary and the Accent of the Headquarters Department of the Army. What should be our policy response to questions like this? And, uh, and this, there are going to be some interesting ones and some difficult ones. Uh, in the Instagram generation, I would say that privacy is not 
necessarily the top of their concerns as they're you know posting selfies of themselves everywhere and at all times. Um, but that being said, it's still a, it's a serious question, right? And so uh, I think we need to parse out what data uh, needs to be private for privacy concerns and what data needs to be private for security concerns, and those are two very different things. Um, much data can be anonymized and aggregated and still be very valuable in what it tells you about the trends of training and outcomes. Colleges are looking at this to figure out how, you know, within 10 days, which students are likely to fail. So they can either say, try a different major or a different life path, or take up this tutoring and we'll help you get through college. And those incentives are in line, aligned because those colleges get paid based on graduation rates. They graduate more students. One of them actually found they had like 300 students that dropped out but were, had enough credits to graduate. And so they called them up and said, do you want us to mail you your diploma, right? <laughs> so there's all, this, all these surprises kind of hidden in this data. Uh, and, and that's where it becomes valuable are the surprises of things that you didn't know. So anyway, in the, in the terms of privacy, I think there are many approaches that are already being taken that can anonymize and aggregate data and still be valuable. And then there are ones where people are willing to give up their privacy because they get value out of it. And I think that's a big part of it is the transparency of what you're doing with that data and are you feeding it back to those individuals in a way that's helpful to them. Because I think one of the biggest concerns that come out is asymmetry. Is if some group has completely opaque uh, privacy and another group has completely transparent privacy, uh, who has the power, right? And so if you're being transparent about how it's being used and that it is a mutual transparency, you're gonna get fewer complaints, I'd say that. I very much agree with what Justin said. And, and the other thing to think about with data is essentially what's come up with Mr. Kidd's scenario is a sustainable business model for the solution providers in terms of the ability to provide um, tech um, improvements and enhancements and, and how are we going to pay for it and how are we going to keep the operations and maintenance of it. And then it gets into a larger question of data monetization. You know, what is the cost or value of data? And, and who's benefiting from it? And who's, you know, able to release it? And, and those are bigger questions beyond just uh, privacy or security that, frankly, we haven't cracked the nut on. Um, and, and it's an, gonna be an ongoing question as we move forward in terms of the value of data and how we can all benefit from it um, on a bigger platform. Real quickly, there's a human component too. I mean, us as a society, we're all cool with Google and Facebook knowing more about us than the intelligence community and the NSA, right? And that's cool with us, why? Because it's the intentions. We don't think that Google necessarily is doing some nefarious thing. We think we're getting something personally out of it because they know where I'm gonna search and it saves time. So I think the workaround for the data on installations is that we could do an AUP or we could work it out and show them, hey, this is a benefit to you, this is how. And what this leads to, and it, it goes right back to what you were saying earlier, sir, Colonel Duggan, is the, the need for a governance team. There needs to be a clearly established entity who's gonna take on the governance responsibilities to determine how, how and what is private. And how is this data gonna be used? How is this data gonna be monetized? You know, there's a, there's a value to your data that commercial businesses off your post want. They should not get that unless they're bringing value to you. And so that governance model, and, and as, as Slam said, you know, we're all still struggling with this. I'd say follow industry, but industry doesn't know how to uh, and has not defined yet where privatization begins and ends. If I post something on Instagram between me and a friend, should that be available for everyone to read? I mean, I should assume it is in today's world, right? We shouldn't assume anything's private anymore. None of us should ever assume a single thing we do is not being, you know, put out under the, for the whole world to see. But is that what we want our community members to fill on an installation? That if they say or do something, that it should be shared with the local Walmart? Or shouldn't it be? And, and those kind of governance decisions, none are gonna be easy in this, in this scenario, but you really should have a team that's responsible for establishing the governance rules of how you're going to treat the privacy of this data for your community, your constituency that, that are members of, a, of an installation. Okay.
Secretary Kia, would you please wrap it up? So, uh, boy, a lot was covered today, and I, I, I'd like to thank our panelists for giving me actually too much material for the wrap up. But I would just talk, uh, I think one, so first of all, we'll take away from Kevin, I wrote this sentence down, and it will probably appear in our, our, our documentation going forward, is it, that we need to orient installations on the future for the people who actually live on them. So I think, and that doesn't, that's not an age issue, it's a digital native, non-native issue. And uh, I think that was, you know, one takeaway that I'm gonna come back to our processes with right away. But I thought I, I, I listened to, to everyone talking about innovation. So if you try to wrap one word up, in my mind, it's innovation. That we, the Army, have to be postured to innovate, not just the modernization, not just the futures command on the six priority weapon systems, but all across the Army. We need an innovative culture. We can't just innovate in one or two areas or zones. We, the Army, as a whole, have to adopt that culture. Um, two weeks ago, I had the privilege of going out to Silicon Valley with a group of uh, public executives to look at the cultures in Silicon Valley, and we were briefed by a, a, a president of, a, of a, a major corporation. He's a, I don't know, a major lieutenant colonel in the reserves and runs a $150 billion business line, all right? He's very influential, and he summarized, uh, you know, some pluses and the minuses for the Army, and I'll just sort of jot these down. We can all think about them as we go forward. He says, you know, there, he gave a list of all the things that innovative organizations have, and a couple of them that the Army has. We have a shared mission. We have a sense of purpose as an Army, all right? Innovative, innovative organizations share a sense of purpose. Maybe it's to beat the next company to market with the latest version of the iPhone or to, you know, enable uh, uh, information, you know, universal access to information. But innovative companies have a shared mission which orients everyone in the organization. There's a level of trust. I mean, in the Army, if someone says something, it's generally true, all right? We trust each other up and down the, the rank and file. There are pockets of, of innovation in the Army that we know we can do it, and specifically, you know, the special operations community. I think it's no, it should be as no surprise that that's the community that Pat comes from, all right? An innovative, uh, fast-moving organization. And, and, um, uh, you know, those are the things that, that organizations that we in the Army have in our favor when we talk about innovation. Less so, though. We are very hierarchical, right? Uh, we, uh, the, the rank structure, which might be important to combat, may not necessarily allow the free exchange in, uh, of ideas. And I went from the Army with a big office and two or three people making sure no one got into it to living in, in, the, in a room in the White House where we were all the same space, GS-12 to SES and all on a first name basis. And it was a lot faster and more innovative. Uh, the Army is risk adverse. The private sector tests to failure. So in other words, they'll do 100 tests and if 99 of them fail, they learn from each one. So often for the Army, if we test and it fails, then it's the failure on the part of the officer or the program manager. So we test to success. We need to reverse that mentality a little bit. And then, of course, the, the very uh, elaborative decision-making processes that we have to go through for resource expenditures, which goes back to that risk aversion. And uh, General Cardone is also, you know, he's the Director of the Office of Business Transformation. We do have an Army Innovation Strategy. But, uh, you know, I think that this is something we need to go back to over and over again, become an innovative army, not just at the pointy end of the spear, but also on our installations, because we're all in the battle space now. Um, I'd like to thank the panelists once again. Great job, folks. Thank you. Good. Thanks.